Hello YouTube. Today I will tell you about a very unusual investigation that took place in the Soviet Union and a most unusual human being, if that's what he was. He was a great scientist, philosopher, who discovered many unusual things and whose death prompted the KGB investigation back in 1972. And for the 35 years after his death, the volumes of the information collected are still kept hidden. Although Russia is no longer communist, everything has changed, but you see secrets, they do not change. And uh, matters of state security involving more than foreign adversaries are at stake even 35 years after the death of the person involved. Ivan Antipovich Efremov was born in 1908, we think. He was the son of a peasant's daughter and a Russian government official. He was a doctor of biological sciences, a brilliant science, fi science fiction writer, and a bold visionary. Ivan Efremov had written more than 100 scientific works. Yefremov's encyclopedic comprehensive knowledge included biology, physics, astronomy, sociology, philosophy, and medicine. He coined the term taphonomy, the science that studies process of decay and fossilization, and he founded the study of taphonomy back in 1940. And because of that, he turned paleontology into exact science. Bear with me, I have to tell you much more about this person and everything ties in. And I gotta tell you that uh, I was a teenager who read some of his books. I was already interested in the paranormal research per se, but he influenced my life. And uh, it prompted me many years later to travel to Africa and do my own research. But let's get to that point. Yefremov was able to predict the discovery of diamond deposits in Yakutia. And I mentioned some of them in my previous uh, lectures. And I do want you to keep an eye on developments in Yakutia from now on. And also, because of Yefremov's ideas, um, a Soviet scientist some years later was able to discover practical holography. The KGB later whined that, the, that Yefremov knew where the diamond deposits were located, but would not tell the Soviet authorities, and instead revealed the state secrets to his story. He wrote short stories, wonderful ones, if you ever can find them uh, in English and a number of other languages his works were translated to. He knew much more than was revealed, but you have to be able to read his stories to discover secrets and mysteries which are still to be open. Yefremov was equally at home among the stars, in the open ocean, in the cataclysms of the distant geological era, or in the non-existent world of antimatter. Now this is according to Professor Olson, a form former member of the National Academy of Sciences and a recipient of numerous medals and awards who knew the Soviet scientist and corresponded with him. Olson described his colleague as a person who seemingly did not feel boundaries of time and space. Yefremov wrote about alien artifacts found during paleontological expeditions. This was his novel titled Starships, but it was not published until 1948 because the, of the ideas presented in that book that there were many inhabited planets in the universe, that the evolution of the sapient beings is quite similar, that all sentient beings are humanoid in appearance. Haven't you heard something like that in other historical uh, books? This was his ideas. All intelligent beings look like us. 
Ephrema was convinced that all claims to the effect that we will not be able to understand civilizations that have arisen on other planets in different conditions were groundless. The fact in his words was this, the universe is built according to the same plan, from the same bricks of our elements, with the same properties and cause and effect relationships. Consciousness, thought and intellectual matter throughout the universe are structured in accordance with these laws and as much as they originate from them, represent their product and reflection. Therefore, we would definitely understand each other's minds. We cannot fail to understand extraterrestrials. <clears throat> Ephraimus was only able to publish a story he wrote back in 1943 about genetic memory. He was only able to publish it in 1968. It was called Secret from Hellas, or Ancient... Uh, <clears throat> Greece. It was too mystical for the Soviet regime. There had to be knowledge in his possessions that has not been revealed fully. In one novel, Ephraimov wrote that Imhotep, in ancient Egypt, was directly seeking information and receiving accurate answers from the Egyptian uh, deity thought uh, in his sanctuary in a place known as Ras Souls. The wise Imhotep, a great mind, as we know, statesman and scientist of ancient Egypt, came back to his pharaoh with the accurate answers and much more knowledge. He was shown wonders that no previous pharaohs had ever been shown. Imhotep was given knowledge back in approximately 28 AD BCE, in the period when many other centers of newly gained knowledge sprang up in China, Crete, Shumer, and India, when men received knowledge from gods who arrived on our planet. And I talk about this period in my other presentations, for example about ancient China. Imhotep kept objects similar to powerful modern computers in a special sanctuary. Professor Ephraimov was fascinated also by Menon civilization, ancient Crete, Crete and its mysterious vanished inhabitants. He seemed to know much more than was relieved, revealed in his novels. And my own investigation of the ancient Crete began because of him and I'm finding more and more fascinating information and I'll reveal one day what I have found. Professor Ephraimov knew English, French and German, knew and discussed Agni Yoga, the esoteric teaching founded by the Russian painter and philosopher Nicholas Rerich and his wife Elena. Ephraimov also knew well a very curious book unavailable in the Soviet Union. It was called I'll translate it from French, The Morning of the Magicians. And really, it was the uh, generator of most of the New Age literature we know today. If you haven't read this book, try to find it. Throughout his novels and stories, he was greatly influenced by ancient Greece. Ephraimov was a lover of life. He constantly emphasized beauty, especially the beauty of human body, beauty of healthy eros. He hated religious fanatics, all those who destroyed beauty and human psyche. Ephraimov possessed incredible knowledge of hypnosis. His experimental, so to say, book, The Razor's Blade, published in 1963, is notable for a huge amount of the scientific facts and dynam dynamism, hypnotism, generic memory, human psyche, Alexander the Great and his mysterious crown found at the bottom of the ocean. Please see my presentation about Namibia because I talk more about this in my uh, video about Namibia. And Ephraimov also knew again about ancient India and revealed it in that great novel. It was full of non-stop adventures but much more because he slowly revealed some of the knowledge, the full extent of which 
like I said, we will not know probably for a long time. Now, this book, I recall from my childhood and teenage years, it was always the bestseller of the Soviet black markets. And it was reprinted in the Soviet Union, but very hard to obtain. Yefremov was quite familiar with Buddhist Hinayana and Mahayana systems. He knew the Pythagorean and Gnostic teachings. He learned five stages of yoga, and he was very much interested in ancient Christian uh, sects, such and also movements such as the Nestorianism and others. He was not an adherent of occult scientists. And Yefremov was an atheist, and he believed in his version of communism. He was not a mystic, but neither was he dogmatic. Alan Yefremov, his son, revealed that his father was greatly interested in Hinduism. At the same time, he possessed a great talent. He could accurately diagnose diseases, surprising doctors. He told his son that nothing pointed to Nicholas Rurik's spirit passing away. But that's another story for another time. But please remember it. All the skills and talents and abilities Yefremov possessed. According to Chudinov, who was the PhD of Biological Sciences, and Professor Yefremov's student and assistant, Yefremov possessed fantastic sense of being one with nature. It seemed to people around him on occasions that he had visited the areas where his expeditions arrived in. Although they knew for certain he had never been there before, it seemed that he knew the destination he was going to well before he got there. Yefremov believed in the spiritual power of a man, psychological and physical self-improvement. He created a vision of a magnificent, brilliant, breathtaking future of humankind, mankind, of space exploration, of cooperation between ours and the extraterrestrial civilizations through the use of the so-called Great Circle, a marvelous association that consolidates isolated planets like our Earth, in the interconnected totality by remarkable methods of communication. Long before it was an issue, Professor Yefremov demonstrated concerns about ecology of our planet and harm to the environment during the nuclear arms race. <clears throat> in, towards the end of his life, Yefremov was interested in everything except political science, according to his son. The extent of the man's knowledge was immeasurable. Ivan Yefremov had his own vision of communism. The stupendous future he described in Andromeda, the Space Age tale, and in the book titled Core Serpentis or Heart of the Snake in 1958, that future was drastically different from the dreary contemporary Soviet reality. This did not bode well with the Soviet leaders and, of course, their tool of control, the KGB. But Soviet people loved his novels. Many of them, including cosmonauts, chose their professions and education because of the influence of Yefremov's books, which were translated into dozens of languages of the world. Yefremov never mentioned Russian communist leader Lenin in his futuristic novels, although he was pressured to. In the 1930s, the Communist Party would not accept him for membership because of his father's wrong social class. And in the 1950s, Yefremov declined to join the Communist Party, stating that his father's social class had not changed. He was a brave person. The authorities tried to silence any mention of Yefremov's achievements, even in paleontology, after his death. And for a number of years, they did succeed. Now I want to tell you about the strange KGB investigation. It was one month after his death, in October of 1972, that the KGB sealed off his modest apartment um, full of books, diaries, scientific treatises, maps, notebooks, and many other items. Eleven officers 
search the apartment for over 13 hours using x-rays and a metal detector. The KGB had searched the apartment of the fa famous paleontologist. They intended to open the urn with Ephraim's ashes, but his wife Taisia would not let them do it. When she tried to find out later what was the reason for all this excitement and search, the KGB said that they found an anti-Soviet article, someone who left no return address, mailed to the writer. At the same time, the widow was repeatedly questioned about her husband's wounds and all the details of his life, from birth to death. The prosecutor's office wanted to know how many years she actually knew Yefremov. She asked the KGB a direct question. Question, what are you accusing him of? She wanted to know. The direct reply was that they are not accusing him, as he is a dead man. Ephraimov's wife kept a copy of the KGB search report. It stated that they were looking for ideologically harmful literature. That's what they used in the Soviet Union. Anything that questioned the regime, anything they, the, those who ruled my country, the Communist Party, considered to be of harmful nature, was banished. The KGB confiscated Ephraimov's old photographs from different periods of his life, his letters to his wife, letters from the readers, photos of his friends and receipts. No author's manuscripts were taken, but they did take homeopathic medicine bottles, some minor things, a book about Africa in English. It had dried leaves inside, maybe that's why they wanted to take it. Ephraim of geological minerals, a cane with a sharp metal object inside, and a stick made from colored metals. They never returned the last two objects. The KGB continued the investigation of Ivan Ephraimov's life and activities for eight years after the writer's death. The Ephraimov's dossier or file comprised over 40 volumes. It was very interesting after the Soviet Union even before the Soviet Union disintegrated, when it was possible to talk about um, things that were forbidden for so many years. And three Russian investigative journalists tried to uncover the truth. One of them, Ismailov, published his findings in Neva magazine back in 1990. Two others, Nikita Petrov and Olga Edelman, published their findings in 2002. <coughs> they were able to see the files pertaining to the case files but files from the office of the prosecutor of the USSR. The prosecutor's office was empowered to oversee cases initiated by the state security services KGB and every criminal case had its own twin file in the prosecutor's office where updated information from the case was filed. The case had a special designation uh, in the Soviet Union for the investigation. The contents of the file provided no clear answers and raised even more questions. The cause of death was not determined and Ephraimov might not have been the person uh, he appeared to be. That it was the file stated. And because of the above, a criminal case was opened and an investigation started in January of 73, 1973. No mention of the November search of the previous year um, of the deceased author's apartment was found in the file, although the prosecutor's office authorized it, as the journalist learned later. The criminal case was officially closed in March of 1974, and the prosecutor's office was informed. Fifteen people were questioned about Ephraimov's identity, and it was determined that he died from natural causes. But you see, the KGB investigation went on. Many years later, Ismailov was able to meet with the investigator who told him that there was no underlying denunciation against Ivan Yefremov. Habibulin, the original investigator, was very reluctant to talk about the case even in the final days of the Soviet Union. In 1989, 
the journalist was able to get an official response from the Moscow KGB office that the search of Yefremov's apartment was due to suspicion that the author died a violent death. But the search had caused that such suspicions were not confirmed. So you see how complicated it was getting. Okay? Now, there was another hypothesis. According to the rumors that spread through Moscow in 1972, after the search, Yefremov was actually a British agent who substituted the writer during the Mongolian expeditions. We'll get to those. Some rumors mentioned that the KGB installed recording device in the author's home and recorded his death. According to the former office of the KGB's second department, counterintelligence, uh, to a person uh, whose last name was Karolov, who published his article in 1991 in the Stalitsa magazine, their Moscow office had few activities to occupy the time. Although they were harassing uh, dissidents, breaking up anti-Soviet organizations and so forth. To justify their murky existence, Lieutenant General of the KGB Alidin decided to make Efremov into a British agent. Why was the case against Efremov initiated by the KGB? The British espionage accusation is not in the files pertaining to the case. Accusation of anti-Soviet activities is nowhere to be found in the files, unlike in most other KGB files. But you see, there may be files that are missing from the special division today. The prosecutor's office division that handled Efremov's files would not even deal with major espionage cases. But with the author's death, um, Efremov had been suspected to be a spy. However, with his death, the case would have been closed. Yet it was not. So what remains is the mysterious verification of identity, the accusation that Yefremov was not who he pretended to be. The investigative journalist came to a conclusion that for some unknown reason, the KGB needed a formal cover-up to initiate a criminal case against the Russian writer. Inconsistencies did not bother the KGB operatives. When the need to continue the case was gone, they stopped the case. It's all very complicated. Extraterrestrial hypothesis is something we need to talk about. There is one explanation of the case against Efremov. Arkady Stugatsky was one of the most famous international science fiction writers, and he had an explanation which he gave in his conversation with the journalist who investigated this case. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, the United States Armed Forces and the CIA had created departments that had seriously studied flying saucers and possibilities of extraterrestrial invasion of Earth. That's according to Stugatsky. The Soviets might have similar ideas. Several books uh, co-authored by Philip Mantel and myself describe Soviet military research of UFOs as well as the KGB interest in the subject which dated back to 1920s. And here Stugatsky, maybe, maybe unbeknownst to him, was right in the sense that the Soviets had similar agencies and programs, such as the Setka program I described before. And the very unusual Soviet author really interested the KGB. At the same time, Soviet science fiction fa uh, fans came up with a persistent idea that leading science fiction writers were agents of extraterrestrial civilizations. So what if a KGB officer who took over the newly created agency believed in the absurd idea that science fiction writers are extraterrestrial agents? He ordered that Efremov was to be under observation while he was alive, as they were afraid to capture a live alien whose actions could be unpredictable. But when the author or alien died, they could uncover some means of his communications 
with a civilization that was well advanced in comparison with others. Not knowing what the means would look like, the KGB grabbed whatever they could when they searched Yefremov's apartment. Not finding what they were looking for, they later returned most of the objects. This account explained the unusual KGB conduct, the search of the apartment after Yefremov's death, confiscation of certain items, their attempt to open the urn, the KGB concerned that the author was cremated on the second day after his death, no autopsy was performed, even strange questions asked of his wife, and the statement from the KGB that Yefremov was not accused of anything. But again, we still don't know what's inside those 40 volumes. Now, Africa, Africa, this is very important. And life-giving water. I'll, I'll mention a few things and I'll make a separate presentation about it. But at least you need to find out. Ephraimov, according to his son Alan, named in honor of Alan Quatermain from H. Ryder Haggard's novels. Alan, himself a geologist. And he mentioned that Ephraimov, his father, loved Africa and had many books about the continent in English, German, and French. And for those who don't know, H. R. H. Ryder Haggard was the author of King Solomon's Mines. A famous book about Southern Africa. In 1942-1943, Ephraimov wrote and shortly, shortly thereafter published a story titled Meeting Over Tuscarora. In its plotline, Ephraimov was trying to tell the world something very important about the life-giving water discovered in the ocean vats near South Africa, including the coordinates where this life-giving water can be harvested from the ocean's floors. It's a tremendous story that needs to be explored more, and I'll tell you later. But Professor Ephraimov had an obscure comment about this story in September of 1972, not long before he died. Commenting on, commenting on his early stories, he wrote that the problem of the heavy water accumulation at the ocean depths outside of the thermal mixing still remains open. And it is quite possible that the aging Polyduro would be interested in the source of his knowledge. I doubt that this is so, it's just something to consider, but sometimes we are giving information that can change history, but we don't see it. And that's what I believe Ephraimov did in his story. And by the way, one of the reasons is his attitude to Africa that made me fall in love with Southern Africa and uh, do my own investigation of some of the things that he wrote about. But let's talk about Mongolia, about the dinosaur bones, giants, and worms of the Gobi Desert. In 1946, the Paleontological Institute of the Soviet Academy of Sciences dispatched expeditions to the Gobi Desert to search for fossils. The actual field expeditions of 1946 to 1949 were led by Ivan Yefremov. Great discoveries were made despite the fact that the expeditions were poorly equipped and used inadequate means of transportation. The final expedition took place in 1949. Yefremov and his colleagues, having explored more than 25,000 kilometers, discovered many new sites with a great number of dinosaur and other reptile bones. He made an assumption, assumption that Central Asia during Cretaceous period was a territory with numerous bogs or swamps, water and luxuriant vegetation. Those conditions were favorable for dinosaurs. Therefore, one could expect to find their remains and plenty of fossils. 
Well, 460 cases, more than 120 tons, were taken to two museums in the Soviet Union and Mongolia. This is what was discovered. It's like he knew that they would be there. But if Remov's health that actually deteriorated during the expeditions. However, as, as, as reported in an article from an obscure Russian magazine back in 2002, Efremov did discover something else in Mongolia. In a valley of burial grounds, he found one that contained a skeleton of a giant measuring almost three meters. And if you remember my other presentations and the humanoids I talk about, that uh, measure almost three meters and mysterious humanoids in the central lakes of in the lakes of Central Asia and Siberia L look at my other videos after I read you this tell you this now that discovery was very unusual the way it was discovered he knew where the burial ground was going was located it was very difficult to remove the uh, plates that were put over the grave so he led the expedition to the side of the burial ground they were able to unearth the body not the body but the skeleton of that being that was buried and it had no wrists it's like somebody cut off it's like somebody was trying to keep it inside and not release it very interesting he did mention the discovery in his books um the roga vitrov the road of winds or also known as the gobi notes is a non-fiction book by Ivan efremov about his three years travel to mongolia when when he was the head like i said of the joint soviet mongolian paleontology expedition um, in chapter 9 of the book, Efremov wrote that they had to dig uh, laterally from the side under the monolithic plate, under other well situated plates uh, they discovered under a hill, and it's in the vicinity of the Harkandaiko River. The last plate, six square meters in sight, could not be removed by the expedition's mechanical means. Right under the plate, in the layer of loose sand, they discovered a skeleton of a huge, tall man, over 60 years of age. He was resting on his back, facing west, his face looking upward. Strangely, the skeleton was missing wrists of both arms. There was absolutely nothing near the deceased. No fragments of dishes, no broken weapon, no traces of any decorations or clothing, as if the person was buried absolutely naked. Some people suppose that it was a slave or an enemy, some, you know, buried there. But in this case, this gigantic structure was meaningless. Such huge plates could be moved by a good hundred men, and then only, like, under a whip, under being exerted. The bones of the deceased had been extensively damaged by water that leaked from a slope into the area under the plate. One member of the expedition applied carpenter's glue to them to put together. The expedition took the bones, uh, to, to, uh, took the bones and the skull, um, uh, and also very unusually massive lumbar vertebrae. Judging by the skull, the deceased was not a Mongol, but a representative of European race. With extreme, extreme care, they packed the bones that had rested under the plate for almost 3,000 years. And later, they handed the bones over to the Soviet archaeological expedition, led by Professor Kiselev. That's very interesting. A Russian author published an article back in 1991 in a well-known Soviet uh, magazine, Nauka and Religia, titled uh, Yefremov and Agni Yoga. She wrote that Yefremov headed the joint Mongolian-Soviet expedition uh, in the desert and that um, he recalled the carefree and happy uh, days of the expedition. And he brought out various related photos from his hidden archives and commented on them. 
uh, the author especially recollected that this description of the excavated ancient burial ground where under a tremendously heavy monolithic plate was located a gigantic uh, skeleton of a human being over two meters tall and this being was of some unknown to science pre-Mongolian people the finding according to Re uh, uh, Ephremov who lamented it was so much contradicted everything that was already known and established that it was not allowed to publish it the photograph the Soviet government would not allow to publish him the photographs were those hidden archives ever found by KGB operatives what happened to the bones and who was this mysterious giant so diligently buried away under the huge structure um, I want to let you know that there are rumors in the Soviet Union I've read some not many but obscure that Ephremov was looking for the so-called philosophers stone in Mongolia too but I don't have more information than what I'm telling you but you should know that during his travels in Mongolia Ivan Ephremov heard rumors and legends about the Mongolian worm and he published a story in 1944 about the deadly encounter with this creature Algoi Horhoi is said to possess an effective ability to kill people and animals instantly at a range of several feet this huge Mongolian worm Ephremov described the creature that belonged to a completely unknown species it was a great thick worm uh, that um, wriggled over the sand repulsive and seemingly helpless when approached by man the worms turned into rings and their color changed and darkened the worms killed two men in the story who ran toward them but how did they kill those men Ephremov described some ancient Mongolian legends the natives were quite terrified by the creature and the worms were never examined by explorers the creature kills at a distance and inflicts instantaneous death it might do so by an exceptionally powerful electrical discharge or some poison it emits in 1972 professor Ephremov wrote there there have been no confirmation that the worms actually exist today that it was, was a, it was a creature that had become extinct extinct but kept alive in folk tales but some explorers today would argue his conclusion now something else I want to let you know is that um, while in Mongolia he came up with a very interesting hypothesis about the earth rotation axis the imaginary line that goes through the north and south geographic poles and that the earth rotates around earth rotation causes day and night to occur Ephremov advanced the idea that around 300 million years ago the earth rotation axis was in the plane of sun's orbit what forces would have tilted it to its present location and what terrible consequences had resulted from the disaster of such proportions this is a mystery that has not been solved yet I urge you to read his books some many of them are available in English uh, there are good translation so you can find them on the uh, search for them land of foam f-o-a-m is one of the greatest novels about a great slave uprising in ancient Egypt and uh, how the slaves were able to travel to Africa and they came from all over the world there were Samoites and ancient Greeks and other people and people of Africa fighting together united against oppression and how later they traveled to their land of origin from Africa and you find out quite a lot about ancient Africa Egypt Crete also his novels about the space exploration and um, extraterrestrial and where we would find bones of the extraterrestrials it's incredible and you can find those books in English well in memory of the great Soviet Russian writer astronomers of the Crimean Astro uh, uh, Astrophysical Observatory 
um, named after him one of the asteroids uh, in the solar system. There is uh, his memory is retained in Russia even today, and I hope it doesn't doesn't disappear because there is so much there is so much that we need uh, to find out. And uh, I will try to speak more about him, but you can see it in my writings, in my books, and in my presentations that the information comes out. And that ancient period that I mentioned, I'll try to do, to do as much as possible about my own discoveries. And in my video about ancient China, you can pick up some information. But let me end by this. Efremov had very interesting connections among Chinese scientists. And they gave him something very unusual. And a globe made thousands of years ago, metallic globe that showed Earth as we know it to be today. There must have been other connections we know nothing about, but they knew about him. And maybe one day we'll find out what's hidden inside the 40 volumes. Thank you.